Why do ghouls and other creatures of the night haunt the remnants of the House of Doom? Sax Romer, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our financial supporters. We couldn't do this without you, and we really appreciate your support. We've set it up so that for a $5 monthly donation, you get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. Give more, and you get more. It actually takes quite a bit of work to make this show every week, and I really appreciate all the help I can get. The content creation, the direction, editing, marketing, artwork, and of course the narrating, that's all me, one guy. I also have to hire out some of the work as well, so every little bit helps. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com today and become a financial supporter. You'll be glad you did. Thank you so much. And if you can't support us financially right now, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts so more people can find us. 813 the fourth novel in the Arsène Lupin series, is also now available. Head on over to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and pick up this fantastic adventure. And this is the last week where you can save $2 when you get 813 by entering the coupon code PODCAST. No subscription, no additional support necessary, just enter the word PODCAST and save 2 bucks. This is the last week for that offer. Thank you so much for your support. The Society of Voice Arts and Sciences has nominated Scaramouche as a finalist for a Sovas Award. We are going up against a few icons in the narration industry, whom I've actually paid for training. It's about as prestigious as they come. I'm shocked and honored to be a nominee for this very special award. Many thanks to all of our supporters who helped to create this amazing audiobook. Well, the leaves are turning in the Utah mountains, and it's getting close to the time for the Halloween game. That's just what we call it. We have a huge horse chestnut tree in our front yard. We have a pretty small front yard. The tree is about the only thing there. Each year about this time, all of the horrible spiky chestnuts start to drop. Scylla started this game when the kids were little, and we do it every year. You just take the chestnut out of the horrible housing and throw it back up into the tree to try to knock down other clusters of nuts. It was so fun when the kids were little. I was usually gone, actually, working on sets or working in shops, so it wasn't until they were teenagers I even knew this was a thing. But the little ones grew up doing it. Now we need to move cars and schedule it, but it's still a fun tradition. To make some time, we go out, and we all throw nuts at the tree. It's a little thing, but we still look forward to it. And now, it's time for some Halloween creepiness. The Night of the Necropolis, Part 3 of 8, by Sax Romer. Chapter 8, The Secret of Dune. Lord Lashmore was a big, blonde man, fresh-colored, and having his nearly white hair worn close-cut, and his mustache trimmed in the neat military fashion. For a fair man, he had eyes of a singular color. They were of so dark a shade of brown as to appear black, southern eyes, lending to his personality an oddness very striking. When he was shown into Dr. Cairn's library, The doctor regarded him with that searching scrutiny peculiar to men of his profession, at the same time inviting the visitor to be seated. Lashmore sat down in the red leathern armchair, resting his large hands upon his knees, with the fingers widely spread. He had a massive dignity, but was not entirely at his ease. Dr. Cairn opened the conversation, in his direct fashion. You come to consult me, Lord Lashmore, in my capacity of occultist, 
rather than in that of physician. In both, replied Lord Lashmore, distinctly in both. Sir Elwyn Groves is attending you for certain throat wounds. Lord Lashmore touched the high stock which he was wearing. The scars remain, he said. Do you wish to see them? I'm afraid I must trouble you. The stock was untied, and Dr. Cairn, through a powerful glass, examined the marks. One of them, the lower, was slightly inflamed. Lord Lashmore retied his stock, standing before the small mirror set in the overmantel. You had an impression of some presence in the room at the time of the outrage, pursued the doctor, distinctly, on both occasions. Did you see anything? The room was too dark. But you felt something. Hair. My knuckles, as I struck out, I am speaking of the second outrage, encountered a thick mass of hair. The body of some animal. Probably the head. But still you saw nothing. I must confess that I had a vague idea of some shape flitting away across the room. A white shape. Therefore probably a figment of my imagination. Your cry awakened Lady Lashmore. Unfortunately, yes, her nerves were badly shaken already, and this second shock proved too severe. Sir Elwyn fears chest trouble. I am taking her abroad as soon as possible. She was found insensible. Where? At the door of the dressing room, the door communicating with her own room, not that communicating with mine. She had evidently started to come to my assistance when faintness overcame her. What is her own account? That is her own account. Who discovered her? I did. Dr. Cairn was drumming his fingers on the table. You have a theory, Lord Lashmore, he said suddenly. Let me hear it. Lord Lashmore started and glared across at the speaker with a sort of haughty surprise. I have a theory. I think so. Am I wrong? Lashmore stood on the rug before the fireplace, with his hands locked behind him and his head lowered, looking out under his tufted eyebrows at Dr. Cairn. Thus seen, Lord Lashmore's strange eyes had a sinister appearance. If I had had a theory, he began, you would have come to me to seek confirmation suggested Dr. Cairn. Ah, yes, you may be right. Sir Elwyn Groves, to whom I hinted something, mentioned your name. I am not quite clear upon one point, Dr. Cairn. Did he send me to you because he thought— In a word, are you a mental specialist? I am not. Sir Elwyn has no doubts respecting your brain, Lord Lashmore. He has sent you here because I have made some study of what I may term— Psychical ailments. There is a chapter in your family history. He fixed his searching gaze upon the other's face, which latterly has been occupying your mind. At that, Lashmore started in good earnest. To what do you refer? Lord Lashmore, you have come to me for advice. A rare ailment, happily very rare in England, has assailed you. Circumstances have been in your favour thus far, but a recurrence is to be anticipated at any time. Be good enough to look upon me as a specialist, and give me all your confidence. Lashmore cleared his throat. What do you wish to know, Dr. Cairn? he asked, with a queer intermingling of respect and hauteur in his tones. I wish to know about Mirza, wife of the third. Baron Lashmore. Lord Lashmore took a stride forward. His large hands clenched, and his eyes were blazing. What do you know about her? Surprise was in his voice, and anger. I have seen her portrait in Dune Castle. You were not in residence at the time. Mirza, Lady Lashmore, was evidently a very beautiful woman. What was the date of the marriage? 1615. The third baron brought her to England from Poland. She was a Pole? 
a Polish Jewess. There was no issue of the marriage, but the Baron outlived her and married again. Lord Lashmore shifted his feet nervously and gnawed his fingernails. There was issue of the marriage, he snapped. She was my ancestress. Ah. Dr. Cairn's gray eyes lighted up momentarily. We get to the facts. Why was this birth kept secret? Dune Castle has kept many secrets. It was a grim noble of the Middle Ages who was speaking. For a Lashmore, there was no difficulty in suppressing the facts. Arranging a hasty second marriage and representing the boy as the child of the later union. Had the second marriage proved fruitful, this had been unnecessary, but an heir to Dune was essential. I see. Had the second marriage proved fruitful, the child of Mirza would have been, what shall we say, smothered? Damn it, what do you mean? He was the rightful heir. Dr. Cairn, said Lashmore slowly, you are probing an open wound. The fourth Baron Lashmore represents what the world calls the curse of the House of Dune. At Dune Castle, there is a secret chamber, which has engaged the pens of many so-called occultists, but which no man save every heir has entered for generations. Its very location is a secret. Measurements do not avail to find it. You would appear to know much of my family's black secret. Perhaps you know where that room lies at Doom. Certainly I do, replied Dr. Cairn, calmly. It is under the moat, some thirty yards west of the former drawbridge. Lord Lashmore changed color. When he spoke again, his voice had lost its timbre. Perhaps you know what it contains. I do. It contains Paul, fourth Baron Lashmore, son of Mirza, the Polish Jewess. Lord Lashmore reseated himself in the big armchair, staring at the speaker, aghast. I thought no other in the world knew that, he said hollowly. Your studies have been extensive indeed. For three years, Three whole years from the night of my twenty-first birthday. The horror hung over me, Dr. Cairn. It ultimately brought my grandfather to the madhouse. But my father was of sterner stuff, and so it seems was I. After those three years of horror, I threw off the memories of Paul Dune, the third baron. It was on the night of your twenty-first birthday that you were admitted to the subterranean room. You know so much, Dr. Cairn, that you may as well know all. Lashmore's face was twitching. But you are about to hear what no man has ever heard from the lips of one of my family before. He stood up again, restlessly. Nearly thirty-five years have elapsed, he resumed, since that December night. But my very soul trembles now, when I recall it. There was a big house party at Doom, but I had been prepared for some weeks by my father for the ordeal that awaited me. Our family mystery is historical, and there were many fearful glances bestowed upon me, when, at midnight, my father took me aside from the company and led me to the old library. God, Dr. Cairn, fearful as those reminiscences are, it is a relief to relate them to someone. A sort of suppressed excitement was upon Lashmore, but his voice remained low and hollow. He asked me, he continued, the traditional question, if I had prayed for strength. God knows I had. Then, his stern face very pale, he locked the library door, and from a closet concealed beside the ancient fireplace, a closet which hitherto I had not known to exist, 
he took out a bulky key of antique workmanship. Together, we set to work to remove all the volumes from one of the bookshelves. Even when the shelves were empty, it called for our united efforts to move the heavy piece of furniture. But we accomplished the task ultimately, making visible a considerable expanse of panelling. Nearly forty years had elapsed since that case had been removed, and the carvings which it concealed were coated with all the dust which had accumulated there since the night of my father's coming of age. A device upon the top of the centre panel represented the arms of the family. The helm, which formed part of the device, projected like a knob. My father grasped it, turned it, and threw his weight against the seemingly solid wall. It yielded, swinging inward upon concealed hinges, and a damp, earthy smell came out into the library. Taking up a lamp, which he had in readiness, my father entered the cavity, beckoning me to follow. I found myself descending a flight of rough steps, and the roof above me was so low that I was compelled to stoop. A corner was come to, passed, and a further flight of steps appeared beneath. At that time the old moat was still flooded, and even had I not divined as much from the direction of the steps, I should have known at this point that we were beneath it. Between the stone blocks roofing us in oozed drops of moisture, and the air was at once damp and icily cold. A short passage, commencing at the foot of the steps, terminated before a massive iron-studded door. My father placed the key in the lock, and holding the lamp above his head, turned and looked at me. He was deathly pale. Summon all your fortitude, he said. He strove to turn the key, but for a long time without success, for the lock was rusty. Finally, however, he was a strong man. His efforts were successful. The door opened, and an indescribable smell came out into the passage. Never before had I met with anything like it. I have never met with it since. Lord Lashmore wiped his brow with his handkerchief. The first thing, he resumed, upon which the lamplight shone, was what appeared to be a bloodstain spreading almost entirely over one wall of the cell, which I perceived before me. I have learned since that this was a species of fungus, not altogether uncommon, but at the time and in that situation, it shocked me inexpressibly. But let me hasten to that which we were come to see. Let me finish my story as quickly as may be. My father halted at the entrance to this frightful cell. His hand, with which he held the lamp above his head, was not steady. And over his shoulder I looked into the place and saw him. Dr. Cairn, for three years, night and day, that spectacle haunted me. For three years, night and day, I seemed to have before my eyes the dreadful face, the bearded, grinning face of Paul Doom. He lay there upon the floor of the dungeon, his fists clenched and his knees drawn up as if in agony. He had lain there for generations. Yet as God is my witness, there was flesh on his bones. Yellow and seared it was, and his joints protruded through it, but his features were yet recognizable, horribly, dreadfully recognizable. His black hair was like a mane, long and matted. His eyebrows were incredibly heavy, and his lashes overhung his cheekbones. The nails of his fingers— No, I will spare you his teeth, his ivory gleaming teeth, with the two wolf fangs fully revealed by that death grin. An aspen stake was driven through his breast, pinning him to the earthen floor, and there he lay, 
and the agonized attitude of one who had died from such awful means. Yet, that stake was not driven through his unhallowed body until a whole year after his death. How I regained the library, I do not remember. I was unable to rejoin the guests, unable to face my fellow men for days afterwards. Dr. Cairn, for three years I feared. Feared the world, feared sleep, feared myself above all. For I knew that I had in my veins the blood of a vampire. Chapter 9 The Polish Jewess There was a silence of some minutes' duration. Lord Lashmore sat, staring straight before him, his fists clenched upon his knees. Then, It was after death that the Third Baron developed certain qualities? inquired Dr. Cairn. There were six cases of death in the district within twelve months, replied Lashmore. The gruesome cry of vampire ran through the community. The fourth baron, son of Paul Doon, turned a deaf ear to these reports, until the mother of a child, a child who had died, traced a man, or the semblance of a man, to the gate of the Doon family vault. By night, secretly, the son of Paul Doon visited the vault and found the body, which, despite twelve months in the tomb, looked as it had looked in life, was carried to the dungeon, in the Middle Ages a torture room. No cry uttered there can reach the outer world, and was submitted to the ancient process for slaying a vampire. From that hour, no supernatural visitant has troubled the district, but... But, said Dr. Cairn quietly, the strain came from Mirza, the sorceress. What of her? Lord Lashmore's eyes shone feverishly. How do you know that she was a sorceress? he asked hoarsely. These are family secrets. They will remain so. Dr. Cairn answered, But my studies have gone far, and I know that Mirza, wife of the third Baron Lashmore, practiced the black art in life, and became, after death, a ghoul. Her husband surprised her in certain detestable magical operations, and struck her head off. He had suspected her for some considerable time, and had not only kept secret the birth of her son, but it secluded the child from the mother. No heir resulting from his second marriage, however. The son of Mirza became Baron Lashmore, and after death became what his mother had been before him. Lord Lashmore, the curse of the House of Dune will prevail until the Polish Jewess who originated it has been treated as her son was treated. Dr. Cairn, it is not known where her husband had her body concealed. He died without revealing the secret. Do you mean that the taint, the devil's taint, may recur? Oh, my God, do you want to drive me mad? I do not mean that after so many generations which have been free from it, the vampirism will arise again in your blood. But I mean that the spirit, the unclean, awful spirit of that vampire woman, is still earthbound. The son was freed, and with him went the hereditary taint, it seems. But the mother was not freed. Her body was decapitated, but her vampire soul cannot go upon its appointed course until the ancient ceremonial has been performed. Lord Lashmore passed his hand across his eyes. You daze me, Dr. Cairn. In brief, what do you mean? I mean that the spirit of Mirza is to this day loose upon the world, and is forced by a deathless, unnatural longing to seek incarnation in a human body. 
It is such awful pariahs as this, Lord Lashmore, that constitute the dangers of so-called spiritualism. Given suitable conditions, such a spirit might gain control of a human being. Do you suggest that the spirit of the second lady, it is distinctly possible that she haunts her descendants, I seem to remember a tradition of Dune Castle, to the effect that births and deaths are heralded by a woman's mocking laughter. I myself heard it on the night. I became Lord Lashmore. That is the spirit who was known in life as Mirza, Lady Lashmore. But it is possible to gain control of such a being. By what means? By unhallowed means. Yet there are those who do not hesitate to employ them. The danger of such an operation is, of course, enormous. I perceive, Dr. Cairn, that a theory covering the facts of my recent experiences is forming in your mind, and that is so. In order that I may obtain corroborative evidence, I should like to call at your place this evening. Suppose I come ostensibly to see Lady Lashmore. Lord Lashmore was watching the speaker. There is someone in my household whose suspicions you do not wish to arouse, he suggested. There is. Shall we make it nine o'clock? Why not come to dinner? Thanks all the same, but I think it would serve my purpose better if I came later. Dr. Cairn and his son dined alone together in Half Moon Street that night. I saw Antony Ferrara in Regent Street today, said Robert Cairn. I was glad to see him. Dr. Cairn raised his heavy brows. Why? he asked. Well, I was half afraid that he might have left London. Paid a visit to Myra Duquesne in Inverness? It would not have surprised me, nor would it have surprised me, Rob. But I think he is stalking other game at present. Robert Cairn looked up quickly. Lady Lashmore? he began. Well? prompted his father. One of the Paul Pry Brigade who fatten on scandal sent a veiled paragraph in to us at the planet yesterday, linking Ferrara's name with Lady Lashmore's. Of course we didn't use it. He had come to the wrong market, but Ferrara was with Lady Lashmore when I met him today. What of that? It is not necessarily significant, of course. Lord Lashmore, in all probability, will outlive Ferrara, who looked even more pallid than usual. You regard him as an utterly unscrupulous fortune hunter. Certainly. Did Lady Lashmore appear to be in good health? Perfectly. Ah. A silence fell, of some considerable duration. Then, Antony Ferrara is a menace to society, said Robert Cairn. When I meet the reptilian glance of those black eyes of his, and reflect upon what the man has attempted, what he has done, my blood boils. It is tragically funny to think that in our new wisdom we have abolished the only laws that could have touched him. He could not have existed in ancient Chaldea, and would probably have been burnt to the stake even under Charles the Second. But in this wise twentieth century, he dallies in Regent Street with a prominent society beauty, and laughs in the face of a man whom he has attempted to destroy. Be very wary, warned Dr. Cairn. Remember that if you died mysteriously tomorrow, Ferrara would be legally immune. We must wait and watch. Can you return here tonight at about ten o'clock? I think I can manage to do so, yes. I shall expect you. Have you brought up to date your record of those events which we know of, together with my notes and explanations? Yes, sir. I spent last evening upon the notes. There may be something to add. This record, Rob, one day will be a weapon to destroy an unnatural enemy. I will sign two copies tonight and lodge one at my bank. Chapter 10 The Laughter Lady Lashmore proved to be far more beautiful than Dr. Cairn had anticipated. She was a true brunette, with a superb figure, 
and eyes like the darkest passion flowers. Her creamy skin had a golden quality, as though it had absorbed within its velvet texture something of the sunshine of the South. She greeted Dr. Cairn without cordiality. I am delighted to find you looking so well, Lady Lashmore, said the doctor. Your appearance quite confirms my opinion. Your opinion of what, Dr. Cairn? Of the nature of your recent seizure. Sir Elwyn Groves invited my opinion, and I gave it. Lady Lashmore paled perceptibly. Lord Lashmore, I know, she said, was greatly concerned, but indeed it was nothing serious. I quite agree. It was due to nervous excitement. Lady Lashmore held a fan before her face. There have been recent happenings, she said, as no doubt you are aware, which must have shaken anyone's nerves. Of course, I am familiar with your reputation, Dr. Cairn, as a psychical specialist. Pardon me, but from whom have you learnt of it? From Mr. Ferrara, she answered simply. He has assured me that you are the greatest living authority upon such matters. Dr. Cairn turned his head aside. Ah, he said grimly. And I want to ask you a question continued Lady Lashmore. Have you any idea, any idea at all, respecting the cause of the wounds upon my husband's throat? Do you think them due to something supernatural? Her voice shook, and her slight foreign accent became more marked. Nothing is supernatural, replied Dr. Cairn but I think they are due to something supernormal. I would suggest that possibly you have suffered from evil dreams recently. Lady Lashmore started wildly, and her eyes opened with a sort of sudden horror. How can you know? She whispered. How can you know? Oh, Dr. Cairn. She laid her hand upon his arm. If you can prevent those dreams, if you can assure me that I shall never dream them again. It was a plea and a confession. This was what had lain behind her coldness, this horror which she had not dared to confide in another. Tell me, he said gently, you have dreamt these dreams twice? She nodded, wide-eyed with wonder for his knowledge. On the occasions of your husband's illnesses? Yes, yes, what did you dream? Oh, can I, dare I tell you? You must. There was pity in his voice. I dreamt that I lay in some very dark cavern. I could hear the sea booming, apparently over my head. But above all the noise a voice was audible, calling to me. Not by name. I cannot explain in what way, but calling calling imperatively. I seemed to be clothed but scantily in some kind of ragged garments, and upon my knees I crawled toward the voice through a place where there were other living things that crawled also, things with many legs and clammy bodies. She shuddered and choked down an hysterical sob that was half a laugh. My hair hung disheveled about me, and in some inexplicable way, Oh, am I going mad? My head seemed to be detached from my living body. I was filled with a kind of unholy anger which I cannot describe. Also, I was consumed with thirst. And this thirst... I think I understand, said Dr. Cairn quietly. What followed? An interval, quite blank, after which I dreamt again. Dr. Cairn, I cannot tell you of the dreadful, the blasphemous and foul thoughts that then possessed me. I found myself resisting, resisting something, some power that was dragging me back to that foul cavern with my thirst unslaked. I was frenzied. I dared not name. I trembled to think of the ideas which filled my mind. 
then again came a blank and I awoke. She sat, trembling. Dr. Cairn noted that she avoided his gaze. You awoke, he said. On the first occasion, to find that your husband had met with a strange and dangerous accident, there was something else. Lady Lashmore's voice had become a tremulous whisper. Tell me, don't be afraid. She looked up. Her magnificent eyes were wild with horror. I believe you know, she breathed. Do you? Dr. Cairn nodded. And on the second occasion, he said, You awoke earlier? Lady Lashmore slightly moved her head. The dream was identical? Yes. Excepting these two occasions, you never dreamt it before? I dreamt part of it on several other occasions or only remembered part of it on the waking. Which part? The first. That awful cavern. And now, Lady Lashmore, you have recently been present at a spiritualistic seance. She was past wondering at his power of inductive reasoning, and merely nodded. I suggest, I do not know, that the seance was held under the auspices of Mr. Anthony Ferrara ostensibly for amusement. Another affirmative nod answered him. You proved to be mediumistic. It was admitted. And now, Lady Lashmore, Dr. Cairn's face was very stern. I will trouble you no further. He prepared to depart when... Dr. Cairn, whispered Lady Lashmore tremulously. Some dreadful thing something that I cannot comprehend, but that I fear and loathe with all my soul, has come to me. Oh, for pity's sake, give me a word of hope. Save for you I am alone with a horror I cannot name. Tell me. At the door, he turned. Be brave, he said, and went out. Lady Lashmore sat still, as one who had looked upon Gorgon, her beautiful eyes yet widely opened, and her face pale as death, for he had not even told her to hope. Robert Cairn was sitting smoking in the library, a bunch of notes before him, when Dr. Cairn returned to Half Moon Street. His face, habitually fresh-colored, was so pale that his son leapt up in alarm. But Dr. Cairn waved him away with a characteristic gesture of the hand. Sit down, Rob, he said quietly. I shall be all right in a moment, but I have just left a woman, a young woman and a beautiful woman, whom a fiend of hell has condemned to that which my mind refuses to contemplate. Robert Cairn sat down again, watching his father. Make out a report to the following facts continued the latter, beginning to pace up and down the room. He recounted all that he had learnt of the history of the House of Dune, and all that he had learnt of recent happenings from Lord and Lady Lashmore. His son wrote rapidly. And now, said the doctor, for our conclusions. Mirza, the Polish Jewess, who became Lady Lashmore in 1615, practised sorcery in life and became, after death, a ghoul, one who sustained an unholy existence by unholy means, a vampire. But, sir, surely that is but a horrible superstition of the Middle Ages. Rob, I could take you to a castle not ten miles from Krakow in Poland, where there are certain relics, which would forever settle your doubts respecting the existence of vampires. Let us proceed. The son of Mirza, Paul Doon, inherited the dreadful proclivities of his mother, but his shadowy existence was cut short in the traditional and effective manner. Him we may neglect. It is Mirza, the sorceress, who must engage our attention. She was decapitated by her husband, 
this punishment prevented her, in the unhallowed life which, for such as she, begins after ordinary decease, from practicing the horrible rites of a vampire, her headless body could not serve her as a vehicle for nocturnal wanderings. But the evil spirit of the woman might hope to gain control of some body more suitable. Nurturing an implacable hatred against all of the house of Dune, that spirit, disembodied, would frequently be drawn to the neighborhood of Mirza's descendants, both by hatred and by affinity. Two horrible desires of the spirit Mirza would be gratified if a Dune could be made her victim, the desire for blood and the desire for vengeance. The fate of Lord Lashmore would be sealed if that spirit could secure incarnation. Dr. Cairn paused, glancing at his son, who was writing at furious speed. Then, a magician more mighty and more evil than Mirza ever was or could be, he continued. A master of the black art, expelled a woman's spirit from its throne, and temporarily installed in its place the blood-lustful spirit of Mirza. My God, sir, cried Robert Cairn, and threw down his pencil. I begin to understand. Lady Lashmore, said Dr. Cairn, since she was weak enough to consent to be present at a certain seance, has, from time to time, been possessed. She has been possessed by the spirit of a vampire. Obedient to the nameless cravings of that control, she has sought out Lord Lashmore, the last of the House of Dune. The horrible attack made, a mighty will, which, throughout her temporary incarnation, has held her like a hound in leash, has dragged her from her prey, has forced her to remove, from the garments clothing her borrowed body, all traces of the deed, and has cast her out again to the pit of abomination, where her headless trunk was thrown by the third Baron Lashmore. Lady Lashmore's brain retains certain memories. They have been received at the moment when possession has taken place, and at the moment when the control has been cast out again. They thus are memories of some secret cavern near Dune Castle, where that headless but deathless body lies, and memories of the poignant moment when the vampire has been dragged back, her thirst unslaked by the ruling will. Merciful God, muttered Robert Cairn. Merciful God, can such things be? They can be. They are. Two ways have occurred to me of dealing with the matter continued Dr. Cairn quietly. One is to find that cavern and to kill, in the occult sense, by means of a stake, the vampire who lies there. The other, which I confess might only result in the permanent possession of Lady Lashmore, is to get at the power which controls this disembodied spirit. Kill Antony Ferrara! Robert Cairn went to the sideboard and poured out brandy with a shaking hand. What's his object? he whispered. Dr. Cairn shrugged his shoulders. Lady Lashmore would be the wealthiest widow in society, he replied. He will know now, continued the younger man unsteadily, that you are up against him. Have you? I have told Lord Lashmore to lock at night not only his outer door, but also that of his dressing room. For the rest, he dropped into an easy chair. I cannot face the facts. I... The telephone bell rang. Dr. Cairn came to his feet as though he had been electrified, and as he raised the receiver to his ear, his son knew, by the expression on his face, from where the message came and something of its purport. Come with me, was all that he said when he had replaced the instrument on the table. They went out together. It was already past midnight, but a cab was found at the corner of Half Moon Street, and within the space of five minutes they were at Lord Lashmore's house. Accepting chambers, Lord Lashmore's valet, no servants were to be seen. They ran away, sir, out of the house, explained the man huskily. When it happened, 
Dr. Cairn delayed for no further questions, but raced upstairs, his son close behind him. Together, they burst into Lord Lashmore's bedroom. But just within the door, they both stopped, aghast. Sitting bolt upright in bed was Lord Lashmore, his face a dingy gray, and his open eyes, though filming over, yet faintly alight with a stark horror. Dead. An electric torch was still gripped in his left hand. Bending over someone who lay upon the carpet near the bedside, they perceived Sir Elwyn Groves. He looked up. Some little of his usual self-possession had fled. Ah, Cairn, he jerked. We've both come too late. The prostrate figure was that of Lady Lashmore, a loose kimono worn over her nightrobe. She was white and still, and the physician had been engaged in bathing a huge bruise upon her temple. She'll be all right, said Sir Elwyn. She has sustained a tremendous blow, as you see, but Lord Lashmore... Dr. Cairn stepped closer to the dead man. Heart, he said. He died of sheer horror. He turned to Chambers, who stood in the open doorway behind him. The dressing room door is open, he said. I had advised Lord Lashmore to lock it. Yes, sir. His lordship meant to, sir, but we found that the lock had been broken. It was to have been replaced tomorrow. Dr. Cairn turned to his son. You hear? he said. No doubt you have some idea respecting which of the visitors to this unhappy house took the trouble to break that lock. It was to have been replaced tomorrow, hence the tragedy of tonight. He addressed Chambers again. Why did the servants leave the house tonight? The man was shaking pitifully. It was the laughter, sir. The laughter. I can never forget it. I was sleeping in an adjoining room, and I had the key of his lordship's door in case of need. But when I heard his lordship cry out, quick and loud, sir, like a man that's been stabbed, I jumped up to come to him. Then, as I was turning the doorknob of my room, sir, someone, something began to laugh. He was in here. He was in here, gentlemen. He wasn't her ladyship. He wasn't like any woman. I can't describe it, but it woke up every soul in the house. When you came in? I daren't come in, sir. I ran downstairs and called up Sir Elwyn Groves. Before he came, all the rest of the household huddled on their clothes and went away. It was I who found him, interrupted Sir Elwyn, as you see him now, with Lady Lashmore, where she lies. I have phoned for nurses. Ah, said Dr. Cairn. I shall come back, Groves, but I have a small matter to attend to. He drew his son from the room, on the stair. You understand? he asked. The spirit of Mirza came to him again, clothed in his wife's body. Lord Lashmore felt the teeth at his throat, awoke instantly and struck out. As he did so, he turned the torch upon her and recognized his wife. His heart completed the tragedy, and so to the laughter of the sorceress, past the last of the House of Doom. The cab was waiting. Dr. Cairn gave an address in Piccadilly, and the two entered. As the cab moved off, the doctor took a revolver from his pocket, with some loose cartridges, charged the five chambers, and quietly replaced the weapon in his pocket again. One of the big doors of the block of chambers was found to be ajar, and a porter proved to be yet in attendance. Mr. Ferrara, began Dr. Cairn. You are five minutes too late, sir, said the man. He left by motor at ten past twelve. He is gone abroad, sir. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Night of the Necropolis, Part 3 of 8, by Sax Romer. If you have enjoyed this book, please visit our website at classictalesaudiobooks.com. 
and pick up your copy of 813, the fourth our Zen Lupin adventure. And please rate and review us if you can. It really helps other folks to find our show. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>